Brad Olson is a captivating speaker and author of 10 books, including three in his Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and the newly released Beyond Esoteric. An award-winning author, book publisher, and event producer, his keynote presentations and interviews have enlightened audiences at Contact in the Desert, UFO Mega Conference, the 5D events, and dozens of radio and television programs, including Coast to Coast, Ground Zero, The Patriot Underground, Ancient Aliens, America Unearthed, Beyond Belief, Book of Secrets, The Truth is Out There, and Mysteries of the Outdoors. He has traveled to all seven continents, including Antarctica by sailboat, seeking adventure and the answers to the mysteries of humankind's past. And that is what he will be speaking to us about at the MUFON Symposium this summer. I am very proud and happy to have him as my guest here tonight on the MUFON podcast. Brad Olson, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. I'm glad to have you. I'm more than happy to have you here. I'm looking forward to your talk this summer at the MUFON Symposium. And so I've told our audience a little bit about you. uh, And uh, uh, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit before we get into the Antarctic stuff about some of the books you've written. You're a very prolific author. It looks like you've got at least nine or ten books out there available on Amazon. You have your own author page. So uh, tell us a little bit about some of the books that you've written. And uh, I'm I'm assuming that this is just uh, something that you're passionate about, and so you continue to travel and write about these sort of mysteries around the world. Is that is that fair? That's fair, Richard. I think you uh, said it quite accurately. It's it. It's 10 books now with uh, the release of my third book in the esoteric series called Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet. And in there, I have some of the Antarctica research that I gleaned from my trip down there. I took a sailboat down there five years ago, and it was an incredible adventure, a very rough travel, probably the hardest trip I've ever taken over the Drake Passage. I was seasick for three days and couldn't hold down food for a couple days and (laughs) threw up everything in my stomach. I think I lost about 25 pounds on that trip. But as far as I know, I'm the first researcher in this field to go down there searching out the big mysteries and questions about what is hidden down in Antarctica. And Well, I didn't find directly what I was specifically looking for. I did find some other things that are quite fascinating. And all of this I will present in my presentation called The Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica at the MUFON Symposium, Dallas, Texas, this July. I'm going to be there, and I will be speaking myself. I will not. I will be speaking on Saturday afternoon on the law of secrecy, UFOs, and the need mm-hmm. to know. And uh, I, I'm interested in in this book series, uh, Esoteric. So you've got three books in that series. Most recently, is it Future Esoteric? There's Modern Esoteric, Beyond Esoteric, and now Future Esoteric. There are three in the series, Future Esoterics. Book two in the series, but none of them need to be read in order. They're all standalone books. And it's very interesting you're doing your talk on secrecy because there's a whole section in Future Esoteric called the secrets section because you really can't understand the whole UFO ET enigma unless you factor in the secrecy that's been surrounding all this. And A lot of that has to do with the backward engineering of this technology, making any crash site retrieval uh, top secret because we want to learn about this technology. So it should be not hard for many people to understand that there has been a lot of secrecy surrounding this issue. Some of the top secrecy levels, such as cosmic top secret through the UN, is the highest of all. So you know there's some good material here. And that's what I call esoteric subjects because anything that's been largely withheld from the general population and known to a select few, the textbook definition of esoteric is what it means. Mm-hmm. When I when I think of secrecy, I mentioned this to my my last interview to, to Ryan Wood yesterday. Well, I'm, I'm one of those folks that... that 
sort of feels maybe we can't tell everybody. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, I, I said that to a, a, one of the congressmen that we spoke to recently, and I, I uh, got a little bit of resistance because of that, as you can well imagine, because I, there's, a, a, of course, another part of me, just like the human psyche, that says, well, of course, it's our right to know, but maybe there are some things that might be really too disturbing to know. Like once you learn them, you, you think to yourself, God, we can't tell them this. <laughs> right. you know, I mean, how do you feel about that that sort of point of view? And then that's why it's been so obfuscated and and fear, uncertainty, and doubt put into all of these subjects because the intelligence agencies that manage the narrative largely through Project uh, Operation Mockingbird in the in the media and putting out. Um, false press releases or what we understand about some of these crash retrievals. I mean, the, the crash in Roswell is a cra classic example saying that it was a, a test uh, balloon that crashed and the, the bodies found were test uh, crash test dummies, but they weren't <laughs> even invented till the 1950s. So sometimes the cover story is just so much more ridiculous than just saying, hey, what if we recovered a downed UFO craft in Roswell. And again, that's a total game changer because this changes history as we know it. If we are to just consider one UFO sighting, all it takes is one that's authentic and real. And we're talking about a complete reworking of our history as we know it here on earth. Yeah. I think we're kind of in that place right now. I, I think that, you know, the recent re arrow report uh, was just ridiculous. Uh, it's yeah. clear. It's clear that that folks on the inside, especially inside of these companies that that are conducting this back engineering that you were just talking about, they're certainly aware that that we're being visited by somebody from somewhere else, and they have this technology, and they are trying to back engineer it. And this whole Aero report that just came out is just, in my view, the same thing they did with with Project Blue Book. It's the same right. sort of. Well, we looked into it, and uh, you know, there just really isn't right. anything to it. But you and I both know that that's that's just a, that's that's just a bald faced lie. But what about, what about Antarctica? Because, um, <clears throat> you know, if I think the, a lot of lay people out there and some folks from our own audience will, like I have done, go to, uh, you know, Google earth and go to YouTube and see these things where you have like what look like crashed objects in Antarctica. Some of them look like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm recalling one in particular where it looks like a, a circular object just sort of landed on the ice and came to a halt and there's all these trucks around it. Do you have any kind of uh, opinions about that? And, and if so, are there any specific incidents or um, objects or locations you can think of that really pique your interest relative to crashed UFOs in Antarctica, for example? Yeah, and I collect many of those Google Earth images, especially before they're taken down, or some of them, you can go to the Wayback Machine, uh, and I'll show these in my presentation, one of which is at a German outbase called Conan. And when I was going over maps before my trip to Antarctica, I'm just pouring over maps and looking at the different bases, and I was looking at these maps that were from the Cold War era. They were showing the different bases around Antarctica. And I was very surprised to see the West German flag right there in New Schwabenland. The Germans never left that area that they claimed in the late 1930s before World War II. Wow. And, and so one of those bases, a seasonal base called the Conan Base, has this uh, GPS coordinates of... This area, if you go to it now, it looks like it's a circus tent with all these poles about a quarter mile across, propping it up. But in 2013, they were doing some kind of excavation there and what appears to be some kind of massive machine or downed craft. Apparently, there are three of these large motherships that have been identified since the 1970s by our alphabet agencies, namely the NSA, no such agency, <laughs> who was tasked in the 1940s when it was created to, after Roswell, to manage these uh, crash retrievals and, if necessary, to put out a cover story. And so they nicknamed the three in Antarctica the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria <laughs> after Columbus's three crafts. 
And I would say this one on the Conan base is certainly one of them. I'm looking at uh, another one on the Beardmore Glacier that Linda Moulton Howe's whistleblower Spartan One identified as a giant black, uh, maybe basalt stone craft that uh, I might have an opportunity to go back to Antarctica with a film crew next season. Of course, the seasons are opposite there. So right now it's the end of this season. It goes from mid-November to mid-March down there is the summer season. And if we were to get this financing through uh, VC Cross it is the capital company that wants to raise $10 million to send me down with the documentary career because I know these locations that I want to go to. I'll pitch in a couple hundred bucks. All right, cool. <laughs> well, it's an investment too. And there's a 20% ROI on these uh, nature documentaries. Uh, one of the most popular ones, which has produced 20 times the amount of the investment was the March of the Penguins about the penguins done oh, yeah. in yeah. I think this is way more fascinating going to investigate the downed UFOs to the pyramids poking out of the ice in the Ellsworth Range. I know where these locations are, as well as what I think is the real crown jewel of them all, and that is the Nazi base 211. It's in a location called the Schumacher Hills near this series of lakes called the Schumacher Ponds, named after the pilot that flew the airplane that landed in the lake. It was a, a seaplane. And the, the crew went off for a week to go scout out the location for Base 211 while the pilot Schumacher was doing tests and found out that they're geothermal heated, so they never freeze, even in the Antarctic frigid winters. And the whole area never freezes, what they call an Antarctic oasis right there in uh part of Antarctica that's always frozen under perma ice up on the polar plateau. It's two miles. That's what I, that's what I was just going to ask you. Where is it Where is it uh, relative to the, the polar plateau? So the polar plateau is above these mountains that string along in the, the German claim of New Schwabenland, and that extends over almost all of eastern Antarctica. Antarctica is basically can be divided into two parts. One is Eastern Antarctica, which is the big round shape that you see on most maps. And Western Antarctica is the string of mountains that extends off from the Trans-Antarctic mountain range up to the Palmer Peninsula, the part that I was able to explore five years ago. And that's the little the little finger sticking out that's of the right. top of, of Antarctica, the Palmer Peninsula. That's right. Peninsula. So you, you, you get the finger uh, of Antarctica and then the finger of the bottom tip of South America. And that's the cl closest continental landmass. And it is where most uh, ship traffic, uh, including tourist cruise ships and such as the sailboat that I was on, we left from Ushuaia, Argentina. But if you're flying down there, you would leave from Quintas Arenas, Chile. And this is where a uh, travel group that I went to their office in Puentes Arenas, Chile. They also have one here in America in Salt Lake City. And I went to that office too to ask them about going to some of these locations. And they knew about the pyramid in the Ellsworth range. And I said, well, what do you make of it? Because I showed them a bunch of my photos and stuff. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we fly over that all the time. We know where it is. <laughs> and they called it a nun attack, which means just an attractive mountain sticking out of the ice, nothing made or manufactured. I said, well, have you ever landed there? Do you ever do any tests on it or climb it? Or No, no, no. We just fly over it and point it out to, to the people on our trips. So they can get us to at least that one. And then I certainly want to go to the Beardmore Glacier. And while on that trajectory, the South Pole is not far away, and that's the rumored ho home of the uh, giant hole in the ice, but right, that's what I want. That's what I wanted you to, to get to was this this giant, you know, hole in the ice, which has been reported right. by all all sorts of folks. We know it's there, and so what's in the hole? And well, you know, I mean, I can you imagine having the opportunity to go there and go inside? You know, the rumor is that because of these geothermal uh, he heating elements down there, that that somehow there is a you know a vast, uh, warm uh, underground 
civilization <laughs> that's right. there and and, uh, and the source of many ufos How, what's your take on that well and and what you said about the geothermal features is absolutely right there are more volcanoes in antarctica than any other continent it has 91 known active volcanoes and so the propensity of this geothermal heat creating these large domes under the ice is an absolute known fact in fact there are lakes under the ice. One of them at Lake Bostock yeah. is in the top 10 largest freshwater lakes in the world that hardly anybody even knows about. It's about the size of Lake Ontario, one of our great lakes. And outflowing from those lakes are rivers that flow to the sea with warm water that is heated through the geothermal features. So there's a whole world, a whole ecosystem that exists underneath the ice in Antarctica with the propensity of having warm geothermal heated zones that you might be able to just wear a, a fleece and a t-shirt in, not even that cold and certainly well protected from the frigid temperatures above. So the hole itself was has been around, uh, known for about 100 years. So the very first flight was Admiral Byrd. He was actually a very accomplished aviator. He flew Are we over talking about Project High Jump here? Well, so this factors in uh, another 17 years later. But in 1929, he was the very first aviator to fly over the South Pole. And I don't think he could have missed seeing the big hole in the ice. Uh, and so during the beginning part of Operation High Jump in late 1946, he was I think, summoned to return to Antarctica with only a radio man instead of a whole crew. Uh, he flew from Little America, and there are known to be three hours of missing time. So if you look at his diary, which dates it in 1946, but it's very interesting that his diary was published by his son, that after he came back from a high jump, he had a gag order. He was not allowed to talk directly about Antarctica anymore. There, there's a famous interview he did in the 1950s for Long Jeans uh, Watch Company, and he spoke in very veiled terms, such as what is beyond the pole will be the great explorations of the future. Well, what is beyond the pole? Apparently nothing except for this hole in the ice, right? So he in his diary said him and the radio man flew into the hole and were... First, astonished to see verdant green rolling hills, as well as mega fauna and mega flora down there. This is what he writes about. In his big diary. animals and big flowers and things. That's right. Wow. Yeah, which uh, I could tell you where I was, there's nothing even remotely close to that. You see nothing green in Antarctica. So for him I'm, I'm, I'm immediately getting visions of Doug McClure uh, in the land that time forgot. Remember that old movie with Doug McClure, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and uh, uh, well, one of the, one of the old uh, movie stars, I think that played the, the professor, but that's kind of the vision I'm getting is this, you know, sort of plush green world that, uh, you know, is unknown to the rest of the world. Yeah. Just like that. Exactly like that. Because what happens Next is on this flight of Admiral Byrd, according to this diary that is published, is that first they lose radio contact with Little America, but they keep on flying. And then Admiral Byrd loses control of his plane, but it keeps on going. And then shortly after, these two UFO dis-shaped craft come wingtip to wingtip. He called them flugel rods. That's how he described uh, the name he used in his diary. And then one of the pilots comes on over his radio and with a Nordic or German accent says, Hello, Admiral Bird. You are in good hands. We will short shortly be landing in the domain, the domain of the Ariani. I was just on an interview with Elena Denon describing this whole situation. That sounds said, like oh, Aryans. Aryan, <laughs> Ariani, yes, that's right. And of course we know that the Nazis were absolutely obsessed 
with any kind of inner earth culture, with any sort of artifacts that could give them some kind of advantage in war, and also exploring the origins of the Aryan race. Yeah. So if this was any kind of connection for them, the domain of the Ariani could very well be what they described as the New Berlin. It was a second base outside of Base 211 in New Schwabenland, this being down on the polar uh, through the hole and on the continental landmass. And this East Antarctica is one of the oldest land masses in the world. It broke off from uh, Pangaea or Gondwana land some many million years ago. In fact, there's fossils that connect it to Australia, South Asia, as well as Madagascar and Africa. Same fossils in these countries. And I'll show the connection in the fossil record in my presentation at the MUFON Symposium. It's absolutely fascinating that this old landmass, which is also volcanically active, might house <laughs> this inner Earth civilization. So just to fast forward through uh, Admiral Byrd's experience, he was summoned to meet a person called the Master. And he thought he was otherworldly in many ways or telepathic, uh, but he was pretty much a human-looking entity. And after some greetings, the master then implored Admiral Byrd to take a message back to our Pentagon and military leaders and president to say, we don't want you using nuclear bombs. Uh, it had just been shortly after Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the tests at White Sand, New Mexico, which had UFO sightings uh, over them when they were testing the very first atomic bombs. So they, they was very well aware that uh, humans had... Uh, <laughs> the matchsticks in a very tinder uh, forest that could go up in flames. So the message was, we want you to go back to America and let your leaders know that you're not to mess around with these nuclear weapons. They didn't even want us to use nuclear power either. They just said, get rid of them all together. The master told this to Admiral Burke. He was then escorted out and the pilots took him out the way they came in their fluga rods. And the last thing he heard over the radio is, we're giving you control back your plane now. And he was able to fly it again. And then they said, off be to Shane. <laughs> Goodbye in German. And he was able to fly back out the hole, make radio contact with little America after three hours and fly on back. Uh, and so as a military man, he was still under orders to go forward with Operation High Jump. So they took their armada of ships and assembled with not just American, but other allies from World War II were part of Operation High Jump, which Byrd said before he left was of a military nature. Okay, and, and so this is very unique because the other times he had been down there was mostly just exploring and checking it out, but this was a military operation with an aircraft carrier, submarines, a whole bunch of planes, uh, and a destroyer. And they had done reconnaissance and collected quite a bit of information about the landscape around uh, New Schwabenland and other parts of Antarctica. And Bird was ordered to take his flotilla offshore of New Schwabenland. And there they found some outbuildings of 211. And on day one, they just did a little pitter patter of, of bombings. The next day, they come back with full force to hit this area really hard with bombs. All those planes just went bloop, right off the radar. They never saw or heard from those pilots or planes ever again. What, Same day. What, what, what were the military folks thinking? <laughs> I well, mean, they were, they, they were, they were tra trying to, uh, they still had a, a, a pocket of Nazis that they had to snuff out? Well, that's right. And and the, so the, the secret orders that Byrd was given was to recover a flugelrod. What they wanted most was to get one of these UFO craft. And, well, they got it, but not in the way they wanted it because on that very same day, and it's called the Battle of High Jump, out in the ocean where the flotilla of ships were, these flugelrods came up out of the ocean and they had some kind of force field because nothing could penetrate or shoot them down. And, boy, they tried. But um, in a show of force... One, one of the 
uh, destroyers was taken out by what could be described as a direct energy weapon or a laser, just sliced it in half, uh, the USS Murdoch, and sent it to the bottom of the ocean. With great loss of life, no man can survive the hypothermia more than a couple minutes, so it wasn't even enough time to pick up the survivors. And it's but really it, painful, too, isn't it, when you're it exposed to that cold water? Yeah. And so they were then calling off Operation High Jump two months into the six-month operation. And it was on the way back that Admiral Byrd talked to a journalist from the El Mercurio newspaper, and he quipped that we would be confronted with an enemy that has the ability to fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. And so... That article got published, and uh, when when Bird got back to America, he was instantly put into quarantine and interrogated intensely. Here's one of the most decorated and celebrated military men in history, just being read the riot act for making that uh, admission that we would be confronted with with craft that can fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. And Richard, as far as I know, there are no planes that can fly pole to pole at incredible speeds, <laughs> not yeah. now or since 1947 that we're being told of. Yeah, well, but, uh, and the no, only thing are. we know that can do that are right now UFOs or UAPs. Th th those mm -hmm. are the only kinds of things we know that can travel at, at those kinds of velocities. With a different kind of propulsion system and a different kind of energy source than any of our planes that fly in the military today. So, so, so this, uh, of course, gives rise to all kinds of questions. So, uh, are these uh, Nazis that just went down there and, and started and took all the technology with them and worked on this, or, or uh, are these actually extraterrestrials? Uh, like, for example, the Nordics. Could it be the Nordic race uh, from which the Nazis gained their uh, inspiration? I suppose. Uh, the Nordics that are down there, and they possess this technology because it's it's difficult to imagine simply human beings having done this all on their own without the rest of the human race knowing. I'm just curious, what do you, how do you feel about that? And I could say that uh, myself and other researchers in the field don't know who was behind the fluga rods that came up out of the ocean that confronted the Armada during the Battle of High Jump could have been allied with a reptilian force or it could have been backward engineered craft that the uh, Germans had been working on for over a decade. They had a downed craft in the Black Forest region of Germany in 1933 and even a better preserved, almost fully intact craft came down in the Lombardy region in uh, Italy that Mussolini allowed the German scientists to study and work on. So they had been working on backward engineered UFO type craft before the war even began. And then their their main uh, area of, of doing the research was a location called the Skoda Works, what is today the Czech Republic. And there were sightings of UFOs that were manned by Nazis, as well as diagrams, photos, videos of German craft during the war, including over the big tank battle uh, near Moscow, which was really the turning point of World War II. It was the largest tank battle in history, the Battle of Kursk. And some of the Rus Russians said they saw a hovering UFO, not in battle, but more of a reconnaissance. They did not want their UFOs to be shot down, so they're very protective of them. So then at the end of World War II, it was the Soviets that got to the Skoda Works first, and all that machinery had been taken out, and all those scientists had gone missing. If they weren't missing, they had a bullet in their head, probably because they were told, you're going with this crap to Antarctica, where we're going to continue our research, or you're going to get a bullet in your head. So, Some of them. so we're talking about, uh, obviously, the Wunderwaffen, the, the wonder weapon. This was what they were counting on. And, and so uh, they, uh, are you, uh, they just weren't able to produce enough of them in order to turn the tide of the war into, and decided at that time 
to turn tail and run with what technology they could get away with. Well, that's correct. And basically in, in mid-1943, when the tide had turned and they lost in the Battle of Kursk and the Russians were then pushing uh, westward, many of the top Nazis knew it was lost cause. So they would fight it out and buy themselves time to try to get as much material and riches. There are many metric tons of gold that went missing after World War II, as well as priceless artifacts out of some of the museums. Uh, some had been recovered in, in the salt mines of Salzburg and elsewhere, uh, but others have gone missing, such as the Spear of Destiny uh, is reported to still be uh, lost and, and down in a, a base, possibly in Antarctica. But the money man, Martin Bormann, who at the end of World War II was Hitler's number two deputy. He was rising to the top very quickly. He was the money man, and, and he started several shell companies in South America. He kept popping up all over the place, sightings of Martin Bormann all through the 1950s. And uh, the other thing, when I was going down there, I was poring over all these maps and, and looking at South America too, and finding that there are these huge land holdings in Chile, in Argentina, and in Brazil that are effectively micronations, that, that they basically have the, the resources and the political might to create their own micronations that, that you cannot penetrate. Are the countries, uh, it's sort of like the way the Vatican City in, is in the city of Rome, in the country of Italy, but it writes its own rules. It yeah, it's its, its, its own country. <laughs> yeah, these micronations. So, uh, and I write about this in Beyond Esoteric. I, I talked to uh, John Lear, the famous CIA pilot, who was uh, giving me some information about the micronation. He says, there's more of them than you think. And I can tell you, they're as big as some of our small states in America. They're like the size of Delaware and Connecticut in Chile and Argentina and Brazil. And they're all German. <laughs> and they, they move material and personnel down there even after the war. And some of these uh, U-boats kept popping up in Argentina. The, the U-977 uh, popped up in Mar del Plata, just outside of Buenos Aires, in uh, the summer of 45, after the war in Europe had ended. And when interrogated, they said they were doing the Antarctica route, and they were in a special kind of U-boat called the Führer's Convoy, which were these giant U-boats that, that could have taken the flugelrod in parts. They could have disassembled it into parts, put them in the Führer's Convoy, and that was the, the last U-boats uh, leaving Europe. So they knew the, the war was lost. They just escaped with their top personnel, with all the loot and all the best technology. So the, so the question is, uh, I guess uh, one of the next questions would be, so did they also at the same time abandon their uh, their Nazi principles? Were they, were, oh. were, are they still what you would call Nazis, you know, the kind of people that you wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with? <laughs> well, same philosophy, different people and different generations, but the, the philosophy carries on. In my book, Future Esoteric, I have a chapter called The Fourth Reich in the Americas. Not just North America with our Project Paperclip Nazis, but the whole of the Americas, including Antarctica. And they basically um, instilled the same philosophy. The, the Third Reich was supposed to be the Thousand Year Reich. Of course, it came to an end in 1945 when they abandoned Europe. They knew it was a lost cause, but they could still carry on with their mission of world domination. They knew that they were outnumbered. And they had lost their fighting force. But now it's a different kind of war. It's an intelligence war. And they became the third force. And they largely fanned the flames of discontent during the Cold War between the Soviet bloc and, and the NATO bloc, and which still, you could argue, continues to this day. Uh, but the, this third force, or the Fourth Reich, set up shop in South America. They had all the money. There was a joke I heard down there that uh, the Argentinians and the Chileans, they really don't have indigenous people anymore, unlike 
Peru and Bolivia, which has a large indigenous population still. And so the joke was, well, well, who are we <laughs> as Argentinians? And the joke was uh, they, they are largely European, Southern European immigrants. And so the joke is, well, I guess Argentinians are Italians who speak Spanish and wish they were as rich as the Germans. Because <laughs> it's the Germans who have all the money down there. Even to this day in, in uh, San Carlos de Bariloche in Southern Patagonia, and then I went to the other region above Cordoba, the second largest city in Argentina, which was the industrial hub. And if Argentina wasn't corrupt, just like the Philippines under Marcos, if they were legitimate governments, they would be an economic powerhouse. But it didn't work out that way, and they kept supporting these fascist governments, including Perón who was sympathetic to the Nazis and allowed them to immigrate here, including Hitler himself. There's a great series on the History Channel called Hunting Hitler. It went for three seasons, so about 38 episodes of showing all these locations, many of which in South America I went to, including this town called La Falda, above Cordoba. And there is the Eden Hotel, and I took the tour of the Eden Hotel, and... Uh, Fortunately, my tour guide, he could speak English pretty well because my Spanish is so good. And, and I asked him at the end of the tour, I said, do you really think that Hitler survived the war and, and was here in the Eden Hotel? He goes, well, I don't have to think so. I know so. I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, right here in town, there's an elderly woman who was a chambermaid during her teen years, which was in the mid-1940s, She's still alive or was five years ago. And she has a living memory of Hitler and Eva Braun and even their dog, Blondie, the German shepherd. They all came over in U-boats. They may have gone to Antarctica at some point, but they landed in uh, Mar del Plata. And uh, there are even FBI documents, some are declassified, that talk about how he disembarked with the SS, the elite corps of the German uh, military, which was his protection force, like the Praetorian Guard of the Romans. Just so, to... so the so the story of the suicide in the bunker was just meant to by the Allies to sew this up, so that people didn't have to think about Hitler anymore, and exactly. just simply presume that he was dead and they and that they had defeated the Nazi threat. Is that that's right? And just consider the old saying that history is written by the winners. Well. In this case, the Allies portrayed themselves as the winners, but were they really? Because the last wars of World War II, the very last battle was a submarine battle in the North Sea, and the U-boats uh, just wiped out all the ships that were hunting for the last of the Fuhrer's convoy. That's when they're making their last uh, departure out of Europe from the Kays of Hamburg. Hamburg still had uh, operational U-boat bases till the very end of the war. And that's where the last of the U-boats left in one big uh, convoy down to Antarctica, down to South America. And in the, it's a great book by uh, Henry Stevens uh, called Dark Sun. And it also goes into the whole occultic nature of the Nazis. The and Vril that, Society. <laughs> yeah, the Thule Society, the Vril Society, which goes back to right after World War I, and then the Ananurbe Society, the ancient heritage, where they were looking for all these artifacts and, and any kind of connection to the Aryan race. So hence their explorations of the South Pole. And that was one of the regions that they were exploring in late 1930s. So let's all... talk about that for a second, because um, there, there, I think there's a difference between what you're talking about in terms of an underground uh, base or even a city or civilization uh, that is, you know, a geothermally heated uh, and could probably occupy a vast area in Antarctica under the ice in, in these subterranean heated 
caves and so forth. Yeah. And then, uh, then there's also uh, the uh, the inner Earth theory, where you have basically the crust of the Earth and the mantle, and then th- th- that's all bare. And then there's a central sun where the core of the Earth would be, and there's some kind of a heated element. And th- and so there's people living on the you know basically <clears throat> somebody is walking upside down you know 50 miles below me uh, and, and walking around the so. <clears throat> What what's uh, what do we have there? <laughs> and, and there's even a third type, which are the human-made deep underground military bases or dumps. And in America alone, there's well, we at know least we, we know I mean, could, those are well documented. Yeah, they're, they're well they're, documented. Yeah, right. The continuity of government. And by the way, the engineers who built our underground bases after World War II were the paperclip Nazis. Those engineers came out of Germany. It was the uh, Project Paperclip. Uh, organization, TODT, he was a master engineer. They built Fortress Europe, all the bunkers around Europe uh, to protect from D-Day. Um, and just really by many different blunders of the Germans, they were not able to repel um, the D-Day attack, but they could have and should have. Uh, and there were other uh, landings that the Nazis did beat back quite easily. So we got pretty lucky there with D-Day. However, that technology and those personnel came over here with the rocket scientists like Werner von Braun and Hermann Obereth, who uh, started up NASA. And Hermann Obereth, when asked, how did Germans become so technologically advanced so quickly, said, yeah, well, we, we had good engineers, but we had help. From our friends from above, right, right, and and so so then I, I then I have to then I have to ask, well, are the are, are are some aliens Nazis? Were they really were they really, you know, promoting this, you know, racial purity, genetic purity thing, and telling the Nazis, you know, you really need to you really need to work on this. You need to eliminate all the other. Uh, you know, lineages Aryan other than races. this Aryan, uh, this yeah. Aryan lineage we're talking about. So, was that really supported by extraterrestrials? And if so, doesn't that sort of fly in the face of this notion that you know ET is benevolent and wants nothing but the best for the human race when they're you know attempting to get us to engineer ourselves or or kill people that don't necessarily uh, you know fall into this envelope that they've created. Uh, like the useless eaters, <laughs> and, right? And right. Of, of, of which, race. of which I am proud to be one. <laughs> there you go. Me too. <laughs> I love being useless and an eater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of the joys of being alive. Yes, yeah. <laughs> enjoying a good meal and a glass of wine. Sure. Later, no, I'm going to be a useless napper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, of course, they, they they did have a racial superiority complex, and this is the whole connection with the Aryan race. So if they could find some kind of inner earth enterprise, and then they were scanning on the Tibetan plateau, looking for Shangri-La or Agartha, all these names of these supposed inner earth civilization. Did you know when the the Russians got to uh, the bunkers in Berlin, they're going down there and they found these very dark skinned, Asiatic people, and they had all Harry Carey ritually suicided themselves with their feet in the center of a circle. And it just so happened to be that one of the Russian soldiers was from uh, the far east of Siberia and could recognize their facial features as being Tibetan. They were all Tibetan SS officers that at the very end of the war ritually committed suicide rather than being captured. And it just goes to show how deep the connections were with some of these occult Asian connections trying to find any kind of advantage. And they they called it qualitative advantage. So if they could find an artifact such as the Spear of Destiny, the, the spear point that pierced Jesus Christ when he was on the cross, which... Um, the Ark of the Covenant... Yeah, the, the, anything the like Holy that. Grail. Just like Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is based on truth. They were doing archaeological digs around the world, wherever they could, 
including in the the south of France. So clearly, and, Hitler yeah. was also a, a believer Chateau. in the occult, or at least he believed oh, in the time. in the power of the occult relative to what uh, what you could do with that to manipulate how people thought. So if you say you did happen to find the Ark of the Covenant and you were able to prove that, just simply being in possession of it, you could say, well, the Ark told me to kill a bunch more Jews today. Right. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Just having those yeah. artifacts, whether they, kind of whether in fact they had or right. were possessed of, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, supernatural power, just having them gave you some power, didn't it? Well, absolutely. It? And and if they could possess that, they believed in the, the supernatural power that would give them superiority also on the battlefield. And so they were just absolutely obsessed with this from the beginning. So the the, the top Nazi leaders, including Adolf Hitler and and uh, Hess and um, Himmler, they were all part of the Thule Society in the early 1930s. And they were they they supported it. Nazi Germany was the only government in this modern age that openly supported occultic studies. And that was also with the Vril Society, these long haired women who, after uh, World War I, went to a hunting lodge near Birch's Garden, uh, southern Germany. And uh, my friend and researcher, Frank Joseph, Frank Jacob, he lives. Oh, yeah, down Frank, there. I've met him, yeah. Yeah, and he, he actually found it. Him and his girlfriend found the hunting lodge. It's all boarded up, but it's still there where the Vril women were doing these seances and getting information telepathically uh, from Aldebaran, a very advanced but benevolent ET race. So this is what's kind of confounding to some researchers is, well, why would they give it to them? Well, right after World War I, Germany was still a very technologically advanced country, probably the most advanced in the world. And, but they, were, they could have been on the trajectory of being a peaceful nation had World War II not broken out. So I think the reasoning is that the Aldebarans saw the Germans as the most adept to take this technology, and they were giving them free energy technology, zero-point blueprints that they were able to translate in, with uh, German engineers and technicians and draw them out. And so when the... When, when the Thule Society said, hey, wait a second, we got a military application here, they absorbed that technology into the Nazi war machine and were absolutely obsessed with backward engineering and using this technology for their advantage, that if they had the qualitative advantage, not quantitative with numbers, they knew they never could have enough soldiers, but if they had the best train, the best equipment, and the, the most stamina, and these wonder weapons behind them that they could possibly win the war and eventually become a global domination, the Thousand Year Reich. That was the plan. So um, is that so is that dream dead? <laughs> because well, no, it didn't die. That's, well, that's the that, thing. That's, well, that's what I'm concerned about because we're I still disagree. talking about the the Antarctic uh, yeah. secret Antarctic Nazi base here. And so the question is, are they just gearing up for it? To, you know, it would seem to me that if they were possessed of these kinds of technologies, they could just simply take over the world right now with no problem. And who's to say they're not trying? Look at what's happened in the last five years. Nobody could have seen this coming. A rise of authoritarianism in, in the, in, around the globe. Around the globe, and especially in Western countries, and our loss of freedoms and rights just being stripped away. And now we see it's really globalist in nature, this power structure. You know, if you were to look at a dictionary from the 1950s and look up the word fascist, it would say that fascism is defined as governments that control corporations. But the new form of fascism, and this is a whole section in my book, Beyond Esoteric, Corporations, fascism, <laughs> is when the corporations control the governments. And that's exactly what we have. I look at Epstein Island. It was a big honey pot trap operation to blackmail our politicians and movie stars and influencers and judges and anybody of influence. So they've been working very underhandedly behind the scenes for decades to put together this world control agenda. 
I went and saw David Icke 10 years ago when his 12 and a half hour marathon talks. And he, he was always saying back then that there will come a time when this globalist group will come from behind the closed smoke-filled boardrooms and they will need to implement their new world order plan. So are we are we talking about the Illuminati here? Well, that was the name given back in uh, Adam Bishopt in the 1776 era when he was alive. That's what he called them. I think these secret societies are multi-generational. They are these bloodline families. So the Medici family, which were the original bankers of uh, the Renaissance in Italy, they're still around. The Rothschilds. The Paysours. So are the Rothschilds. So are the Rockefellers in America. They're these big, powerful bloodline families who are globalists. And they want to control the, the show. They're even calling for their own standing armies. They even want to uh, supersede our laws in uh, take over in different kind of ways. So you see it happening. This fas- this new fascism is creeping in. And, and I would say that this is the Fourth Reich. They are certainly uh, players behind the scenes working with some of these other bloodline family groups. But they're all mainly based out of Western Europe but also using America. See, we're the part of the empire of three nations. The USA in uh, Washington, D.C. Isn't it interesting? Washington, D.C. is like a micronation in America. (laughs) Kind of has its own laws, does its own thing. Uh, They are the military force of the empire of three nations. The Vatican City, another micronation. They're the spiritual part of these Empire of Three Cities. And the third is the city of London in downtown London. I've been there. It's really weird. It's its own little micronation in London. It's got its own mayor. It's got its own laws. And the commonality between the three, they all have obelisks. So they're all occultic by nature. We've got the Washington Monument in D.C. Cleopatra's Needle is right on the River Thames in the city of London. And of course, uh, St. Peter's Square in Vatican City has a giant Egyptian obelisk that they took out of Egypt that's right there. So it's all kind of hidden in plain sight, but if you know what you're looking for, and that's why I write these books on esoteric subjects, because I just want people to be informed. Information is power, and if you know what you see, this hidden esoteric in plain sight, it's very obvious what's going on, but... uh, of course, they own the media, and they're they're portraying themselves quite differently there. They're always the good guys. Yeah, uh, I, heard, in their- I, I I wanted to get back to something that earlier that we were talking about, and I'm not sure that I really was able to flesh that out too much. And that was the uh, the nature of the base that we're talking about down in Antarctica. I, I mean, I, I, that's what we're talking about, right? Is an underground base that's heated by these geothermal. Uh, you know, by volcanism, basically, in Antarctica. Uh, but we're not talking about an inner Earth thing. I mean, I'm not saying uh, by this that the inner, there's no such thing as the inner Earth. I, I don't know that. I, I Well, as a scientist, I don't believe that there is. I don't think that that, that that fits with our geology. But that's just my own opinion. But But what, I mean, just to be clear, what we're talking about is, you know, probably vast a vast underground location that is, you know, made temperate by volcanism. Is that fair? Yes. And, uh, and we don't even need to go underground. We don't even need to be a deep underground military base. It's just two miles below the ice on the polar plateau where Bird said he hit terra firma. He was flying over the land. So this is just an under ice civilization when he got to. So this is 1946 and he's coming to the domain of the Ariani. It must have been a pre-existing civilization down there. The the Nazis couldn't have built a, a huge city like this in less than a decade. So I'm proposing that they had allied themselves with the domain of the Ariani. And this was what they described as the new Berlin base. And that's separate from Base 211. Base 211 is in the Schumacher Hills area in New Schwabenland, where the polar plateau and the hole under the ice at the South Pole is is actually 
uh, several hundred miles away and outside of the claim of, of New Schwabenland. But the Germans were flying over the South Pole in the late 1930s, and I think that's when they discovered it. So, so that that being the case, then it's it's very likely, well, at least very possible, that uh, a civilization could have existed there for thousands of years without any without any of our knowledge, and then the uh, Nazis just happened to meet up with them, and and they say, sure, come down yeah. and come on down. <laughs> You guys look like us. We got the same kind of philosophy, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, take you in. <laughs> it's it's, some, it's uh, kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. So, and so what it, about the nature of Antarctica itself? Because uh, Antarctica was not always covered with ice. Wasn't there a time in the geological yeah, past right. when Antarctica was was warm and temperate, and and maybe even had uh, uh, you know was you know, had all kinds of trees and maybe even jungle, uh, you know, uh, 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 do you know anything about that? Do you have any? Oh yeah, you know? sure. I, I talk about this in my presentation at the MUFON symposium. I'll show you uh, pictures of how Antarctica broke off from Gondwanaland, the Pangean mega continent many, many millions of years ago. And then through pole shifts, which is a, a fairly recent discovery that, uh, these continental land masses, while they do drift very slowly, they often move very quickly during these pole shift events. And this was discovered by Jacques Cousteau d taking his mini subs down in some of these uh, cenotes, these giant sinkholes in the Yucatan Peninsula, and finding underwater there were stalactites and stalagmites at 45 degree angles. Well, that makes no sense because a cave dripping uh, mineral deposit have to be dry, right. not underwater, and straight up from each other, 90 degrees. So he proved that the Earth does shift in these very dramatic ways. And the other uh, very telltale piece of evidence is that every lava flow around the world, when the lava is drying, it's magnetic. And at the time it's drying, it it the the magnetic properties of the lava point to the magnetic pole. Now the magnetic pole is different from the geographic pole. In fact, the magnetic pole is is moving very quickly, and this is disturbing because it could indicate that we have another pole shift coming up, which would be absolutely catastrophic. Well, it would destroy everything. It would, well, cer certainly around any coastal communities, not only the massive earthquakes and volcanoes going off, but it would trigger tidal waves that we've never seen before that that could wash all the way over the top of the Sierra Nevada mountains that big. So uh, the, the North Pole geomagnetic is now racing towards Siberia. It used to be pretty stable in the northern Hudson Bay region. Now it's going across the Arctic Ocean towards Siberia. Similarly, the south uh, geomagnetic pole, which used to be on the portion of eastern Antarctica, is now off the continent. So if you were sailing a, a boat around Antarctica and you are using a compass, which was picking up the the pole. It it would point you away from South America if you're at that point where you're between the continental landmass and where the geomagnetic pole is. So it's it's doing very interesting things right now. And I'll also show this uh, on some maps during my presentation. So um, so just to answer your point about that, that um, that you could have. Uh, this continent moving down from these temperate climates. And that is a known fact that Antarctica had once been a steaming jungle because in the fossil records, there's a location at the top of the Beardmore Glacier called Mount Buckley. And the Scott expedition, which was second to reach the South Pole just 35 days after uh, Raoul Amundsen, uh, got there. The Norwegian got there just a little over a month before. It was heartbreaking that the Scott party who had planned this for years got beaten by the Norwegians who used sled dogs. That's how he beat them there. 
And uh, the Scott party were pulling their own sleds. And so they get to Mount Buckley, they're finding ferns in the fossil record. And they're thinking, well, we got to save these. We got to bring them back to the uh, British Academy to study. And that contributed to their demise because they were carrying so much weight back, they couldn't make it to the final uh, supply depot. And all five of the members of the Scott party died uh, from that expedition. And not only that, but they could not recover the body. They just buried the bodies on the uh, into the, the Ross ice shelf. And those bodies, including uh, Scott himself, are still there and will eventually, uh, as all glaciers move towards the ocean and become icebergs and break up, will eventually be deposited into the Southern Ocean. Well, I'm really happy that you that you made it back from the Antarctic because <laughs> most of the uh, the stuff I see on TV, uh, it ends up really bad, just like that, you know, or yeah. like in the thing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Funny how art imitates life sometimes, <laughs> right. or vice versa. Right. Well, Brad, listen, we've we've reached the end of our our hour, but I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here tonight, and I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to seeing your talk this summer. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward to your talk, too, and meeting everybody at the MUFON Symposium this July. Uh, it's a great honor to be asked to speak, and uh, really hope I bring my A game and, and impress everybody as I did tonight with this information, because I, I just really think that we have a right to know this information, that uh, history is not quite exactly as we've been told. In fact, it was the French philosopher Voltaire that had the quote, history is the Mississippi of lies that is just <laughs> largely made up by the winners. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight and, uh, and we'll see you at the symposium and I will be back in just a few moments with some afterthoughts. You are not alone. Thousands of people all over the world have sightings of UFOs per month. MUFON is a place to report them. Since 1969, MUFON has been investigating UFO reports and providing this information to the public. Our aim is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Support UFO research. Join MUFON today. You are listening to the official podcast of the Mutual UFO Network. There is no location on this planet more enigmatic than the vast frozen continent of Antarctica. Is it a home for an ancient race of super beings, highly advanced Nazis, or even aliens? Is there a gaping hole in the ice leading to a subterranean world warmed by active subglacial volcanoes, teeming with strange inhabitants and technological wonders? Perhaps these questions would be easier to answer if it was a simple thing to travel there ourselves to see this frozen continent as it actually is. Unfortunately, the way is hard, long, and treacherous. But we are thankful for adventurers like Brad Olson who travel to the far ends of the earth to answer these questions for us, to seek out the mysteries of life that make life worth living, to then return from their long, arduous journeys and share tales of their adventures with the rest of us. Mr. Olson will be sharing his adventures with us at the MUFON Symposium in Dallas this July, and you are all invited and encouraged to join us. Simply log on to MUFONSymposium.com and get your tickets now while you still can. Thank you for joining us. Please leave your comments below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time right here on the official MUFON podcast. Podcast.